I'm from Shortel. I'm going to be giving a bit of a, a bit of a history of how we managed to get Erlang accepted into a company that had your, your general sort of resistance to change, fear of new things, all that sort of stuff. You know, the kind of company that when you mention Erlang, they go, but where are we going to get Erlang developers? I could go out and hire a thousand Java developers tomorrow, to which you think to yourself, yeah, and then you'll have a thousand Java developers, and then what are you going to do? Now, this whole talk, it's not really intended as a how-to, but it's, it's meant to give you some sort of hope that at least this kind of stuff is achievable. If you are looking for a how-to, thankfully in the last couple of weeks we um, can do the whole thing in just one slide, drop the microphone and walk out of your boss's office, because if they weren't convinced by that, then they're not going to be convinced, which of course leads me to my proposal for Erlang's new tagline. Um, So I'm, I'm visiting here from Australia. I work in a little satellite office of our company down in Canberra, which exists for historical reasons, and now they can't get rid of us as much as they might like to. Um, Cam Australia, known for its beautiful scenery, lovely landscapes, and of course, friendly, welcoming wildlife. <laughs> so when we first came to introduce um, Erlang, I was working for a company called M5 Networks. We produced hosted uh, business phone systems, VoIP as a service. This was before the marketing had, turned the coin, had coined the term cloud, but it's effectively what it is. Um, basically, you just have a phone on your side and an internet connection plug into our system, and we provide all the stuff that you'd otherwise be paying $20,000 for a Cisco box and trying to find your own SIP providers and paying a guy to manage it all and stuff. Um, and we, our, our business model was one of economy of scale. You know, we'd have one server with a couple of thousand companies running on it or what have you. Scaled up to around 10,000-ish phones per physical server. And we did it with a little bit under 100 employees. Of course, technology companies never stand still. We got bought by um, Shortel, who have an office down here in Sunnyvale. Um, they, sell they, they sold premise-based systems, which are the boxes that you buy and put in your own data center. Um, and decided that the cloud and hosted stuff was the way forward, and rather than build their own stuff, they went out and do what any tech company does and bought us. Um, Wikipedia tells me we have something on the order of 975 employees, and some guy in the corridor told me we were the third largest business VoIP provider in the US, which is nice. Apparently, we're, we're behind Cisco and Avaya by quite some distance, but ahead of everyone else. So that's where we, that's where we were in our business-wise. In terms of technically speaking, when I, first, when I first started, we had a code base of about a quarter of a million lines of C++ code. It was massively parallel for some definition of massively parallel. It was pretty robust. Um, when I first started, we were doing the thing where you shut down the system every night and restart it again because it leaked memory like a sieve. And maybe if you did that every night, it wouldn't crash during the day when people were trying to make phone calls. Um, that's, that's, that had improved drastically within a couple of years and, and we had uptime in the sort of order of weeks and months and that tended to stretch between version updates, which was fine for us. Had a fast in-memory database. Um, two reasons for that. One was speed. If you're doing routing for, for a phone call, you don't want to have to go off, make a bunch of SQL queries to find out where to route it from a database that maybe someone's got a lock on and it's going to take a couple of seconds to come back or what have you. So we duplicated all the SQL data into, into memory and were able to make near lock-free requests from that, from that memory, especially for, for read operations. And that gave us very fast routing on our phone calls. And the other reason to have that in-memory database was one of reliability. We didn't trust the SQL server we had at the time, which we probably could have because we never actually had a problem with it. That was MySQL. For various non-technical reasons, we're now using MSSQL, and it's a really, really good thing we've got that in-memory database because it's become unavailable for various reasons during the day numerous times in the past. And given what it was written in, it was, surprising, it was a surprisingly scalable system, considering it was based around, around a few p-threads and work threads and FSMs and what have you. But it was far from perfect. First problem, of course, was that it was a quarter of a million lines of C++ code. And it had been developed by a bunch of different people, as these projects tend to be over the course of 10 years or whatever, and bit rot setting in fairly hard. 
And of course, the, one of the biggest issues with C++ is when you've got this single monolithic Unix process to which all your phones have these TCP connections, you go down a code path that you haven't tested properly because somebody does something weird on their phone, as customers tend to do. Null point of dereference, blam, whole system goes, 10,000 phones suddenly go, can't find server connecting. And everyone has these damn things in their pocket and they call up your support line and suddenly your 20 person support desk has 10,000 calls in its queue and nobody's very happy then. Hot upgrades, not even gonna happen with C++, so you've got a certain amount of fixed downtime there to do any upgrades of your system. If anyone's ever tried to debug a crash in the STL, you'll know what I mean here. It's not a fun place to try to figure out what's going on. Our concurrency model was based on state machines because C++ threads are relatively heavyweight, somewhere between 64K and, and 8 meg, depending on how you configure them. Um, and so basically our, our concurrency system was one of a set of, a, a small set of worker threads, a couple more than the number of CPUs we had. And you've got a bunch of F FSMs, one for each phone or one for each call, depending on how we modeled it for the various bits. And, the, and when a message came in, a free work thread would grab that message, find the FSM it was to, pull that state and execute the function on that FSM with that message and then put it back on the thing, go and grab the next message and so forth. And that's a nice model of concurrency, except that it comes with one major drawback, and that's that the operations within those functions can't block. So you've got to, every time you want to block, you've got to break that state up into two states, one pre-block and one post-block, and you've got to have a message to pull it out of that blocking state. And that's a pain in the backside to code. It makes your code very spaghetti-like because you're, you've got all these separate, separated out functions where really it's a perfectly logical flow of control. It's just that you need to stop and wait for something to happen. And yeah, so threads, threads and processes, as, as we think of them in Erlang, are not a practical concurrency model in C++ for that kind of stuff. But it turns out someone, a bunch of very smart people, one of whom appears to be sitting up at the back of the room, had already thought of this. It turns out we're not the only people to have, to have encountered these problems, which was heartening, but of course we were, we were too not invented here to have ever considered this possibility. Luckily, um, a colleague of mine and I always insist on going to LinuxConf in Australia every year, which is an excellent conference if any of you ever get the chance to go five days of nerds sitting around discussing nerdy stuff, and it's fantastic. And one of the nerdy things that was discussed in 2007 in Sydney was Erlang, this guy talking about concurrency and thousands of threads and really simple model for, for concurrency, and hey, it's got this in-memory database, and naturally we dismissed Sam as a complete lunatic because Sam, my colleague, has a lot of crazy ideas and just chalked this up as another one. Yeah, sure, another language, whatever. I'm trying to fix a null pointer problem over here. All the phones are down again. But on closer investigation, it did seem like it might be a good fit. It had the concurrency, it had this focus on robustness. It was a nice high level language so we could do more in less lines of code. And it even had its own distributed in-memory in DB, which was kind of exactly what we'd already written ourselves, except this one looked like it was good. Come on. So in the interest of giving our lunatic enough rope to hang himself, we found we had a little standalone project. We had to write a TFTP server. Now, the obvious question is, why on earth would you write a TFTP server? There's a billion of them out there already. The Cisco skinny phones we use use TFTP as their configuration system, which is a perfectly sensible thing to use when you're using your phones on a LAN, and about the worst possible protocol in history to choose if you're trying to do stuff over the internet, which we were. Uh, TFTP, and, and furthermore, we needed to do, we needed to have a different file for each of the 10,000 phones that made this request. So you can manage 10,000 flat files in a TFTP directory, or you can dynamically generate them, which is a far more sensible thing to do. Um, the other problem we had with the stock TFTP servers is as soon as you put a device behind a NAT, TFT, TFTP breaks even more than it was before because the way TFTP works is the phone makes a request to port 69 and the response comes back from a different high port, which means that the NAT device goes, what the hell is that? I'm just chucking that away and the phone never sees it. So we had to completely break the TFTP protocol, send all the reports multiplexed out through port 69, but that's okay because Cisco had already broken the TFTP protocol in a bunch of other ways before we got to them, so we didn't feel too bad about it. So we compiled this, uh, wrote this up in, in Erlang, used, used a little bit of the Erlang TFTP code that was already conveniently in there, 
and we put it into production and, and much to our surprise, it kind of worked. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, we're a tough bunch to convince, so Sam went off and wrote the first pieces of what's now known as Flem, the phone logic emulator. Somehow we'd got into this relatively large scale, relatively robust system, testing no other way than plugging a bunch of phones in and having people hammer away at them, which we look back on now with some horror, and you should be looking at in horror as well. The, of course, what you really want if you're going to test that your servers can handle 10,000 phones before those 10,000 phones are all your customers is to buy 10,000 phones, hire 10,000 QA people, plug them on. No, that's a stupid idea. You want a soft phone. You want something that can be scripted, fire up a bazillion instances of itself, and hammer the server that way. And so Sam found some spare time, by which I mean if you need spare time for a project, tell your boss it's going to take four weeks when you know it's going to take two, and then, to, and then take four and use the other two to do this. Um, spare time, wrote up a, a, SIP soft, uh, sorry, a skinny soft phone in Erlang. And this was kind of where I got a little bit interested and took a look at the code, because it was pretty short and pretty concise and kind of even readable for someone who, in uni, I hated functional programming languages. I could never get the hang of them, but this Erlang thing kind of made sense to me. And I picked it up, and I'm like, well, one phone's nice, but I bet we could do more, because this is a concurrent thing. Sure enough. Within a day, I had it spawning a thousand phones on my laptop, and now we had something, or at least the start of something, that was usable as a load tester. Whoops, wrong button. Maybe Sam was onto something here after all. But Sam and I are just two crazy people over in the Canberra office, and the rest of the people are over in New York, and they think we're just some crazy Australians who've been bitten by one too many snakes. Conveniently, I was going over to New York, so I jumped on a plane, flew over there, and I prepared a bunch of talks saying, here's Erlang, here's what it looks like. We think it's awesome for what we're doing because for goodness sake, Ericsson wrote it for telephone systems and this is what we're trying to do here. And look, it's not scary. Here's your QSort, here's your you know, Fibonacci sequence. And I think people kind of started to, to get the idea of it. And demonstrated Flem and the TFTP server, and it's like, hey, this is really cool. Check how quickly and easily we get concurrency in zero time, because we definitely weren't working on this during work hours. But of course, there are going to be naysayers. There are always naysayers. These are some direct quotes from emails I got telling me why I was insane for trying to do this. No inheritance. Well, yes, of course there's no inheritance. It's not an object-oriented language. Kind of missing the point here. You guys can no doubt come up with better rebuttals than I did to these at the time. I'm, I'm more just trying to give you a feel for some of the things you might encounter. Um, no global data at all, which is like killing a dog because it has flies. I think he meant fleas, but either way, it's, again, it's kind of, A, it's kind of missing the point it's missing the point of that this is a different paradigm, but it's also missing the point of why global data is so bad. Like half the problems we had in our C++ code were lock problems, dead locks, not locking hard enough, locking too long, not locking long enough. And the locks, of course, would uh, trip over one another when you, because the locks had to be locked when you were doing those non-blocking loops, so you inevitably introduced some kind of blocking that hurt your performance. The law of leaky abstraction, I hadn't heard this one before it was raised as a, as a complaint, uh, Joel of Joel on Software wrote, a, wrote an article about this notion. And Joel's point is absolutely valid. No abstraction can completely hide, or is able to completely hide the gory technical details of what's going on below it. That's, it. that's completely true. Unfortunately, this guy had taken that to mean we should never bother abstracting anything at all because it's just a lost cause which is clearly not true, otherwise we'd all be sitting here writing machine code and going slowly mad. Skewer language, NetBSD has more websites than Erlang, which was probably true at the time. I actually checked yesterday and, and it's no longer the case, at least in terms of the number of hits Google gives me. But again, this is kind of missing the point and for that matter, comparing apples to oranges. Just because fewer other people are using this thing doesn't mean it's not a great idea. 
It's, um, there's a great quote from Scott Adams, author of Dilbert, something along the lines of, you know, if, if middle managers had run the caves back in Neolithic times, none of it, we'd all be shivering and freezing to death and still in those caves because if everyone was using fire, sorry, if, if fire was such a great idea, everyone would have been using it already. So, and you know, none of our competitors are doing this, well, you're gonna follow our competitors in order to get ahead of them. That's not how getting ahead works. This was the best one. If you like the Erlang syntax so much, just re-implement it in C++ operators. Oh God, don't, no, I don't even, dude. <laughs> all, I, all I responded to this was, dude, you did not just write that seriously. But okay, we, overcome, we overcame those. We managed to convince people that, okay, maybe we should start using it for a couple of bits around, around the edge of our system and see how it goes. Of course, what we'd really love to do is just throw away all our horrible C++ craft that is currently supporting 100,000 people and rewrite everything from scratch. But nobody would let us do that, which was disappointing. So we've got all this legacy code sitting around that, that is in fact the entirety of our system at this point. And so initially we're restricting Erlang use to new functionality and picking features that weren't core. So these are features where if they stop working because we're really new to Erlang and are making lots of mistakes, which was absolutely the case, people will be upset, but not that upset. In the world of telephony, nothing upsets people more than picking up a phone and not getting a dial tone or being dialed to or, or, or knowing that their friend is calling them and their phone isn't ringing. Those are the only two things that have to work all the time. Everything else, call recording, yeah, they'll be annoyed if their recordings don't, ha don't happen or are garbled or whatever, but probably not an, an annoyed enough to quit. CNAM is a... Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's basically a reverse directory lookup system. So you get, you get your caller ID number come in, you send a message off to a third party CNAM provider and say, who does this number belong to? And they send you back a string identifying it as either a name or a company name or a mobile provider or whatever. So again, people are gonna be a little bit irritated if just un 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 bleh, unannotated numbers start showing up on their phones, but they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna go somewhere else in a hurry. And monitoring, customers won't even know if your monitoring goes down for a little while unless, of course, while your monitoring's down, something far more drastic happens. But these are kind of the non-core the non things that, you, that we started building Erlang around and a, 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 as a sort of safe way to start shoehorning it in a little bit around the edges. But of course, it still also has to interface with the old code, which means, in our case, it had to talk our binary struct-based protocol because all our C programs, they didn't talk something nice like JSON or SIP between each other. No, all they did was take a struct, set some values in it, write it onto the socket. And then the receiver has a struct of the same type, reads straight into that memory for the size of the struct. And it's brilliant, it's really quick. There's absolutely no parsing or encoding required or anything. And as long as your system is homogenous and you control the compiler and everything, it works perfectly. It's absolutely brilliant. It's a little bit inefficient if you've got like large, potentially large strings, because it'll write the whole string and all the garbage at the end of it and so forth. But in terms of coding, it's really easy, really nice. And really your entire sending and receiving of messages are those two functions. It doesn't get much simpler. Unless, of course, you need to do it in another language which has no notion of C structs and no notion of the compiler you're using. So the Erlang side, to, to speak that protocol is a little bit more involved. Read off the, the blob from the wire and you use Erlang's beautiful binary parsing syntax to pull out the 32-bit signed little Indian integer at the front and the 64-bit signed, uh, signed long long in the middle and the string and you chuck them all into this record and the string's a little bit difficult because you've got, to, you've got to pull data off only into the null terminator because there's probably garbage after the null terminator. But that's okay, it, it can all be done. And encoding's basically the same thing in reverse. You receive the record, chuck it into a binary, same things. Again, the string's a little bit difficult. You've got to write the, the string itself, making sure you don't run over the size that's been defined in the struct. Um, and then you pad the rest with zeros if you're a little bit paranoid like I am. So that's not too bad, except 
Structs aren't that simple in their layout, are they? Because the compiler quite reasonably likes to align things on the boundary of the first element there. So this is a four byte integer, but this is 12 bytes at the end of the structure, and so we've got to pad out, uh, sorry, 10 bytes at the end of the structure, so we've got to add a two byte padding there. Otherwise, when you chuck all these things into an array on the C side, the integers don't line up and either your computer crashes entirely or suddenly everything gets like 100 times slower. But that's okay, because if you know what the compiler's doing, you can just add in these paddings on the encoding and decoding. And that's not too bad. And so you can go ahead with that. Oh, except, oh, now we're moving to 64-bit and the compiler pads things differently. Damn it. So our long longs now need to be aligned because they're, they're the native data type on the CPU. So we've got to pad after the after our um, four byte integer there, we've got to add another four bytes to align this on an eight byte boundary. And we've got to add a little bit of extra padding so that the whole thing's aligned on an eight byte boundary and same down here. So we've got now two bits of padding and their sizes are entirely dependent on the previous values and it's all getting a little bit complex. And that's exactly where you start going insane when you've got a hundred of those different records and you're having to, in your head, figure out all this, all this padding that's going on and make sure you maintain the struct as well as the encoder and the decoder and the Erlang rec and I hate changing something in more than one place. When I first started, if you needed to change a database record definition, you had to make that change in 19 places in our code. It was insane and, you, and the compiler wouldn't pick up a lot of them if you missed them. So we very quickly came to the conclusion that, that was not going to fly and we wrote ourselves the yarn code generator. Being invested entirely now as we were in Erlang, it, you, it's, it itself is written in Erlang, and being lazy as we were, the parser is the Erlang parser, so the code, the code that we write for the code generator looks a lot like Erlang. So we use the Erlang parser, we use Yek, which is the um, compiler compiler in Erlang, it's the Erlang version of Yek, or uh, Yak rather, if any of you have, have used that, and early DTL as a templating language to spit out the final product. And we thought, why stop it? Why stop it? some Erlang encoding and decoding and the C structs, because we also had a Java external um, program that we needed to interface with, so I made it generate Java classes and marshallers and encoders and decoders for Java as well, so we send stuff over, over the um, interface to a JNode in native Erlang terms from Erlang, and now Java can decode those into native Java types. And Python and SQL, because when we up upgrade the database, we do that with scripts, so we take the SQL, we modify that, the code generator will spit out all that stuff nicely as well. And this means now that if we want to change the database schema, the, the same schema that's read by our Erlang and our C and our Java and on the database itself, we make that change in one place and it just bl blats out to all of these and everything just works. And I am sane again and it's great. So just quickly, it looks, the yarn code looks a little bit like this. You define a record, you can define consts as well and a bunch of other things, but you define a record, you give it a name, and as I say, this looks a lot like Erlang because it's using the Erlang parser, so it tokenizes all this beautifully. Um, integers, long longs, string, and then you can have these annotations on the end of things for things like string length, as is gonna be used in C and SQL. You can say whether you want this to appear in the web editor. I actually missed one on that previous one. It also spits out Chicago boss template files um, for each of these tables so that you can edit Chicago Boss, e edit in our Chicago Boss based web editor. And that goes through early DTL and spits out a C struct and the Erlang and the, and the padded, th and the, the padded encoder and decoder as I showed you before, adjusted appropriately for whatever bit bitage you're running on, 64 or 32. So that was probably, that was, that was the biggest interesting technical thing we, we had to overcome when um, merging Erlang into our existing stuff. But there were a bunch of other things we kind of discovered as well. Um, anyone see my lightning talk on LD last night? Cool. For the rest of you, um, our existing C++ stuff was distributed with in RPMs and started and stopped using init scripts, standard way that pretty much every daemon is managed on Linux. So you go service Apache start, service Apache stop, and they all just work. 
Erlang's VM, because of its embedded heritage, makes some, some of the semantics of that very hard to achieve. Um, clean shutdown is, is one of them if you've got a bunch of sub-applications, but also the one that annoyed us, well, two things annoyed us most. One was that you couldn't output some output to the console and then detach the console. You either ran in detached mode, which automatically returns success regardless of whether your application started or not, or you ran in interactive mode, which means you never got your console back. And neither of them are really acceptable for startup because when a system admin types in service Elvis, as our project is called, start, hits enter, and it immediately comes back to console success, he goes, great, I'm off to the pub. And then he gets a call an hour later saying none of the phones are up. And that's because, oh, it actually failed to start, even though nothing came up on the console and we returned success. And that makes for unhappy sysadmins, which then make me unhappy. Erlde is our little wrapper program that provides those kind of semantics and allows you to start up an Erlang VM and then from within that decide when you want to detach from the console and return success or will, re will propagate through an error code if it, if it halts before that detaching. It will also um, provide you SIGHUP operations. So SIGHUP is used in Linux as a log rotation trigger. You take the logs, you move them to the place you want to archive them, and then you send a SIGHUP command to Apache. It closes that log, opens a new log, and life continues. Erlang doesn't, being largely agnostic, as far as I know, doesn't have any way of intercepting signals. So Erlde will catch the signal, translate that into an Erlang function call, and you can use that as, a, as your log rotation hook. You can also use it for other things if you're so inclined, but log rotation is why we came up with that. We learned pretty early on that monitoring your system is a really, really, really good idea because Erlang, being fault tolerant, will continue to sit there failing while looking like it's continuing to run if you're not looking closely at it. And we first kind of discovered this when, when one of our message queues blew up, as they tend to do when you're still learning Erlang and only have three gigabytes of memory. And message queue blew up, and then we looked back at the log, and it's like, man, we could have seen this coming literally two days ago. Memory use was just going like this, and this process had slowed right down. But we weren't watching it. So we very quickly learned that that's a really good thing to be, be able to do. Use dialyzer. Does anyone here not use dialyzer? Wow, awesome. Good stuff. I don't need to tell you any more then. Dialyzer is awesome. Catches so many mistakes. So where have we got up to now with, with Erlang? We've got, it, we've got it in there. We've started to use some, men, some we started to um, use it for stuff around the edges. Well, we're now at the point where the company and, and all management and every, everything is happy enough with it that we can use it for all our major new features. Every, everything we write, basically, that doesn't require just a tweak to the legacy C++ stuff is written in Erlang. Awesome. I've rewritten two legacy features in Erlang, so parking of calls, which is where you go, I'm just gonna, put, I'm just gonna park this and pick it up in another room. Park, put that down, walk to the other room, pick up the same call there. That bit is now managed by Erlang as of a couple of weeks ago. And the loading and synchronization with SQL is probably the most important bit that's now done in Erlang because if that stops working, our whole system stops working. So that's the first really core bit that has been moved from C++ to Erlang um, because we've, we've got to the point where we trust it enough now to manage that data abstraction layer. Our lines of C++ code haven't gone down. In fact, they've gone up pretty drastically. But, you know, we've been writing a lot of new features. And more importantly, we've got quite a few lines of Erlang now, 171,000, according to a quick count I did, which makes, according to a metric I made up on functionality versus line counts, Erlang in charge of the majority of our functionality. Because I'd say you get at least as much functionality from 171,000 lines of Erlang as 385,000 lines of C. And Erlang's now used for a pile of stuff. So there's the stuff I mentioned earlier, the host of call recording, CNAM. It's also our, our web admin UI, UI, which in a couple of thousand lines replaced 15,000 lines of horrible, horrible PHP that no one could maintain. And what's more, now when we make schema changes, they just, because of yarn, they just automatically get dropped into that web API and we don't have to change anything. Uh, support for the latest phone models is the other thing we're just rolling out this week, in fact. Um, when Shortel bought us, they have their own phones, so they didn't want to be selling Cisco phones anymore. Them, Cisco being a competitor of Shortel, it wasn't necessarily a good look for them to be relying on their phones. 
So support for the short-tail phones is now done through Erlang, through, through a new Erlang module at DB Sync, as I mentioned, call tracking. Um, the, the history of our system came from a couple of guys who wrote it as basically a very simple residential SIP service. So I call you, we talk for a while, we hang up. That's all there was to it. So the notion of tracking calls through these complex flows that they tend to go through in businesses where you hit IVRs and conferences and park and pick up and all this sort of stuff was completely absent. And so the best thing we could come up with for tracking that was basically to write an Erlang module that has a bunch of probes all throughout the system. And when, when a bit of the call code executes this bit, it sends a message to Erlang and it sends a message here. And there's just a big, fairly horribly complex but incredibly amazing piece of Erlang that pulls all these messages together and orders them back correctly and then puts them all together and gives you a view of what a call actually did as it flowed through the system, which was something we never had before. It's also great for billing because it actually tells you how much you should charge your customer for that call, which was not a thing we were good at knowing before. TFTP, as I mentioned, part call management. Load testing, that phlegm tool is now still our standard load tester um, and it's continually being built and improved on. All our system monitoring is now done through Erlang via its, its SNMP system. And SIP director, which I can never remember which order this goes in. I think the SIP director is the one that decides which SIP provider calls go out to as you make, when you make a call. So we have a bunch of SIP providers um, and we'll choose them based on least cost or best quality or whatever, how much we hate or like the customer that's making the call, something like that. So basically, the, the, the summary of this whole thing is when you're trying to build acceptance for, for um, Erlang, you need, to start, you need to start small. You need to start with safe, non-core elements where if they break, and if you're new to Erlang, they're going to break a number of times because you'll be making mistakes, probably a lot of the same ones we made. And if you break something really important, people are going to look at you and go, well, clearly Erlang's rubbish. Stop using it. Get back to the C++. So start small, start safe. Don't build anything critical with it. You're going to make mistakes. Do it one, you know, accept that unless you're incredibly lucky or your company is incredibly crazy, you're going to be doing this one bit at a time. It's not going to be a matter of chucking out the existing stuff and replacing it with Erlang. It depends. Maybe, maybe your company is in a position to do that, but none I've ever worked at have been. You know, it's every programmer's dream to rewrite something from scratch. And it's every manager's complete nightmare because they know that their programmers will be, for all practical purposes, unproductive for the next year as far as their spreadsheets appear. Erlang is easy. I had originally had citation needed. Mike was kind enough to provide me a citation for Erlang being easy in his keynote on, um, yesterday. But building concurrent, high load, high, highly scalable production systems still isn't. So. You can look at Erlang and go, oh, cool, it gives me all this stuff, and my system is going to be so robust and so fault tolerant. And that's kind of true, but it's still not an easy problem. It gives you tools to make it doable. It doesn't give you some kind of silver bullet that's going to solve all your problems. So that's, that's basically my story. Any questions? Anybody? Yes. Sure, so um, I, can, I can give you some rough ballpark estimates, certainly. The, um, we originally started using it in late 2007. Um, the TFTP server was sort of the work of maybe two weeks by one guy. Um, Flem, on the other hand, is, is quite a large project. It's been worked on by a number of people. We've even got um, some Erlang Solutions guys to contract him to work on it. That's been, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even like to guess, but it's probably been a couple of man years work on, on that. But it's also incredibly powerful now. It's got full sort of scripting languages, language built around it, and, and um, it's distributable over multiple nodes, so you can, you're not limited by what you can fire up on, on one machine to hammer the server. And it's, it's got to deal with, like, the, our, our phone call, the, the amount of different permutations we have to be able to test is actually very, very large. It's not just I call you, we talk, we hang up. There's all sorts of 
the XML scripts calls might go through. There's all sorts of core forwarding rules they might apply to, that they might have applied to them. There's conferences, there's um, transfers, there's all this kind of stuff. So Flem's able to actually do and, and test a lot of that stuff automatically and, and report back whether it worked. It's also now got uh, voice quality checking, so it sends down, it, it actually generates and sends DTMF tones and then does an FFT on the far end to check the, the, the quality of the link and stuff. And so at, at one stage, we're not at the moment due to basically lack of resources, but at one stage we were actually using that and automatically making calls out over our carriers every 10 or 15 minutes to check both that the carriers were still up and that we were getting an acceptable quality of service off them. So that was quite a, quite a um, big task getting, getting Flynn to do all of that. Um, what were some of the other things I mentioned? The web UI was probably about, there was two of us working on it, and it probably took us about three weeks to write, which considering it was replacing you know, 15,000 lines of PHP and is way better at it now, it's much nicer and cleaner and uses all pretty CSS things and has slightly pretty colored dialogue boxes and stuff. And considering neither of us were web programmers, or knew the first thing about JavaScript and, or anything, it actually went remarkably quickly and, and, and turned out quite well. So that was, that was a combination of um, Chicago Boss and uh, early, early DTL being able to throw that together so quickly. And then also some uh, JavaScript libraries, um, jQuery and one other one that I can't remember off the top of my head. Oh, Twitter's bootstrap thing as well. So that, that was like a few weeks work. Um, the hosted call recording was not especially big, and in fact, it, it has one of, our, one of our real success stories in it because the code to retrieve the hosted, the, the recorded calls is, com is one of the few things that's completely separate from the rest of the system. So it's, it's one of the few things that we've written from the ground up in Erlang as a standalone, long-running, fairly heavily utilized application. And it's like, even the sort of very earliest versions of that were having uptimes on machines longer than the than the period between upgrades. So I, I, I found one that had been running for a year because someone had forgotten to upgrade it and it's, you know, ticking along, no problems at all. Um, but hosted call recording as a whole was the work of about uh, five people for three months or something, something of that order. Um, CNAM was, was, was pretty trivial because it's just a very, very tiny subset of SIP Gets a we, all we had to do was fire a request from one part of the system into CNAM. It fired a request off to our provider. They sent back, it was a subscribe notify, I think. They sent back a notify with the answer and we fire that back. So the, the only interesting bit of that was that our, our, our lunatic engineer decided that he'd use that as a, as a chance to experiment with functor-based parsers. And so we've got this cool SIP parser, which almost drove him mad trying to write when he realized that the SIP spec, if you try to implement it exactly as it's written, is internally inconsistent and impossible to implement exactly as it's written. Um, SIP is more of a bunch of suggestions than a, than a standard, I've come to the conclusion. Um, the DB sync was, was interesting because that had to sort of perfectly duplicate what was, what was there already and it had to do it in, in an extremely robust, reliable way and that required on our part some patches to the Erlang ODBC libraries because we weren't getting enough error information back about them and stuff. And that, that was mostly one guy and it probably took him a couple of months to, to get that all really bedded down and, and solid and safe. Um, but that's the, yeah, that, those are the kinds of numbers. Does that answer your question to an extent? Yeah. Uh, our team at its biggest has been about maybe 12 people. Um, and for the most part, most of the Erlang guys have been written by a core of about, most of the Erlang stuff rather has been written by a core of about six or seven of us. Um, it's, not, it's not a very big team at all. It was, it was like, not, not wanting to blow my own trumpet, but uh, as a team, it was, quite, it was actually quite remarkable that we got, even before Erlang, that we got the soft switch running as sort of well and as, as, as large scale as we did given the, the very limited um, man resources we had. Mostly they've quit. <laughs> no, that, that, that's not entirely true. Um, no, actually, that almost is entirely true. Most of them now don't work for us anymore um, for one reason or another. Like, I, think, I think one of them 
left when he decided that he really wanted to learn C++ and he didn't like where we were going with this. He was actually the one where most of those quotes came from, especially the um, operation, the, the, the C++ operation one, so I can't say I was too sorry yeah, about that. that. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, that's a really good question. So we had a, we've had a couple of guys join us from the premise team who are they're, they're like people that were in Shortel before they bought M5, and they were all from a pure C++ <coughs> background and, and were understandably interested and yet slightly concerned about being put on our team to, to learn Erlang and stuff. And one of them just recently got pulled off our team, and I was talking to him yesterday, and he's like, so I'm still writing a bunch of Erlang at home because I don't want to forget how to do it because I, I definitely want to get back onto your team and keep working on it because this C++ stuff is doing my head in now, now that I know there's a much better way. And the, the other guys, yeah, there's been no, no problems training them at all. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's required pointing them to the right resources. We, I, I get emails whenever there's a check-in, and I sort of go over their code, not in a sort of formal code review way, but to say, hey, here's a look, here's, here's a cooler way to do this in Erlang, like half the number of lines or whatever. There's still a couple of guys who, who I think are a bit in the C++ mindset and, and as Mike said, try, try to write Erlang as C++, but we're slowly nudging them away from that and getting them to write in a more, in a more functional way. Um, so tra training, hasn't really, training hasn't really been an issue and surprisingly, neither has acceptance for the, for the people who've actually come from one side sort of the fence to the other, if you like. They've, they've actually been quite positive about it and, and, and quite in some ways disappointed that the, the rest of this larger entity now is still sort of a bit reluctant to, to accept it as a, as a good idea. Yeah? Yeah, so, so, okay, so there's, there's kind of two bits of, of handling the RTP. One, one, we do a bunch of just straight packet forwarding, and the, for, uh, the short answer is for all, your, for all the RTP stuff, we actually have C++ drivers, C, C, C++ level drivers for the, for the high performance bits, um, because, precisely because, yeah, Erlang doesn't scale well to just doing nothing but pulling through masses of UDP traffic and shuffling it out another port. Um, and for the bits where we actually do media manipulation, so generating sounds, mixing conferences, and that kind of stuff. That's still in, in the legacy code and hasn't hasn't been ported across yet. We use um, okay. So there's there's two elements to storing voicemail. One is storing the metadata, the record of the voicemail that's that's been stored, and that's done in our standard database, which is the, the back end of that is now uh, Microsoft SQL Server. I didn't choose it. Um, it's not a good choice. But that, that information, though, to the Erlang process is, is accessible through Amnesia because we've got that cache layer there and through for the C++ processes, processes is accessed through the, um, through the memory, through that cache memory thing, and that's, that is linked directly with, with Amnesia and, and all synchronized across there. For the actual storage of the recordings, that's done through a, a very simple um, HTTP uh, put and get operation to a highly available web server with like redundant disks and all sorts of stuff that the systems guys assures me will never lose a voicemail. Um, but it's just posted to HTTP th to what's called our resource server and pulled off that when we need it. Anyone else? Cool. Well, thank you very much for listening.